Today we will solve inhomogeneous evolution equations. So far we have been talking about homogeneous equation which is just this part of the equation and the new thing now is the inhomogeneous term f. Now in order to discuss this we need to clarify some things we have we should have discussed before. Uh, we want to look at this solution u and, and right hand side f as functions defined on the time interval 0 t and having values in in some solvable space h s uh, remember m is the number of components in these equations so it's a vector valued solvable space think of for example u evaluated at t right something like this as a function in space so it's a it's a whole uh, function uh, that means the left hand side here left hand side the time derivative can be interpreted as the time derivative taken in the space hs and the right hand side here the the differential operator here for example it becomes an operator acting in the space hs so a strong hs solution of our initial value problem uh, is a function which is in in c1 and we also want to have to have this differential operator applied to the solution at any given time to be in HS. Um, basically, that means that each term of this equation should be in HS for any fixed time t. And uh, we also want, of course, the initial condition to be satisfied. So basically, uh, this also implies that u is in this space C 0 T H S space and you can see that if a strong solution is regular enough then it is classical it's similar to the strong solution concept for uh, for example Laplace equation if u is, is a C1 and let's take just L2 instead of H S let's take the the time derivative of the Fourier transform of this function. So in order to do that, we, we need to take this difference and take a limit, h going to zero. And that obviously will go to uh, the time derivative of the Fourier transform of u. And you can also write by linearity of the Fourier transform, you can also write it in this way. And now that will go to the Fourier transform of the derivative. And uh, be, here we also take into account that uh, Fourier transform acts continuously between L2 spaces. So uh, that means that the Fourier transform commutes with taking time derivative in L2. So, uh, and you can see that you can actually take any HS space instead of L2. So because uh, of this commutation now, if u is a strong, sol a strong L2 solution of our initial value problem, then you can also write the equation in the free space like this. And now this equation is just an OD for each fixed Xi. So we can actually just solve that OD by using a variation of parameters which is also called Duhamel's principle for ODEs. It's an, a linear equation with some um, inhomogeneous source term. In particular, because we assume that strong solution, implying this representation, a uh, strong solution is, in, is uh, unique. If you, uh, for example, assume some regularity on the initial condition and uh, the right hand side f and uh, we can ask that can you actually write this in the real space instead of in the free space so what would be the analog of this uh, this formula in real space that gives us the so-called Duhamel's principle for evolution equations so let's assume that uh, the norm of the exponential is bounded by alpha t, so it's a bit weaker than assuming strong um, strong hyperbolicity. You can see, 
and uh, assume the, the uh, initial condition and the right hand side f uh, in s some spaces. Then the uh, principle says that any strong L2 solution satisfies this formula. Uh, it's just the analog of the other uh, formula for ODEs. And here, this integral should be interpreted as an integral uh, taking place in L2. Uh, it's an L2 valued integral. Okay where this is of course just a free transform of the of those uh, matrix exponentials it's sometimes called a uh, semi-group propagator so that's this propagator or the free transform of the, of the propagator is just the matrix ex exponential applied to uh, g pointwise in free space now you can see that since we already have this formula in free space what we need to do is to show that this integral makes sense in real space. So uh, first we want to look at the behavior of the integrand. So for example, let's look at the first part of that of the Duhamel's formula. Now, because of the assumption one, we immediately have this bound point-wise, right? And uh, we also know that is pointwise continuous with respect to yeah, as a function of t because this is the solution of some ODE and because of this bound uh, we can apply the dominated convergence theorem to imply that u is actually continuous as a function having values in L2 I mean u0 is, is continuous function and of course we have this bound just because of that. Now uh, we have continuity of the first term, so this term, <clears throat> and now we look at the second integral term. Here you can see that this integral is basically the same thing as, as what we have here. So only difference is the initial time is tau and the uh, time of the evolution is t minus tau here. So let's give a name to that function. So let's call it v tau, v hat tau. And uh, obviously this is continuous uh, as a function of tau having values in L2, uh, just because of, because of this result here. And uh, because it's continuous function of tau, you can integrate it in L2 and this integral exists as a Riemann integral. So that shows that the Duhamel's formula is valid. Now uh, we go further. Duhamel's formula motivates us to define a more general notion of solution called mild solution because we, we saw that a strong solution satisfies this Duhamel's formula we just use this Duhamel's formula to, to uh, define this notion of mild solution. And the only requirement is that U should be continuous. So, uh, so in particular, we don't have to take time derivative of this function. So uh, now this is in some sense the, uh, the other direction of Duhamel's principle. We assume uh, exactly the same assumption then the theorem says that there exists a unique mild HS solution and uh, it satisfies this bound. Now we know that the, the Duhamel's formula gives us a valid function u, so that this uniqueness. The only thing we need to prove is that now this function is, in, is a continuous function. Now we already know that the first part is continuous and here we uh, we proved that the integral makes sense for any time t, but we have not proved yet. It is uh, the second part is actually a continuous function of t. So the only thing missing is the continuity of that integral. So uh, again, we look at the integrand. Now 
uh, because the time t is important, we give also, we also include the uh, parameter t in the function we had. Then the second part is given by this integral. Uh, you can split this difference into two parts and look at the <coughs> uh, terms separately. The fir for the first term, the integral is bounded because from the definition, you can see that uh, we have tau between t and t plus h. That means t minus tau will be between 0 and h. Tau is something uh, varying in a, in a small interval. So this whole thing is bounded. And the interval length going to 0, h is going to 0. So the first part will go to 0 as h goes to 0. For the second part, we can write the integrand in this way. And we see that here again, that part goes to 0 as h goes to 0. Because it, uh, the, this function satisfies some OD with the initial value equal to 1. So that shows that we have continuity. Now, this theorem is an um, improvement on the previous theorem for parabolic operators. So, uh, previously we only had some bound depending on t. Now, here we have a more explicit form of the bound, which even has dependence on psi. So, you can see that this, uh, this class includes the class of Petrovsky parabolic operators. But we, we take here h to be arbitrary positive constant, so it includes more general operators. Uh, these type of operators are called Shilo parabolicity. So this is called Shilo parabolic. Remember that for Petrovsky parabolicity, this H should be equal to Q, that is the highest derivative appearing on the right hand side. For Shilo parabolicity, this H does not need to be equal to Q. And uh, the other assumption is that we, we can assume the initial condition to be in any HR and the right hand side to be slightly less than S where the sigma must be smaller than H. So you can almost take S minus H here. Then uh, the theorem says that we have unique HS mild solution satisfying this inequality. Uh, the meaning of this theorem is that the right hand side can be very rough. So for example, uh, let's say R equal to zero and S equal to one. And immediately when T is positive, your solution becomes, uh, your solution is, is in H1. And the right hand side, uh, by the way, this norm is supremum in time and Hs minus sigma in space. Again, uh, let's say we have a heat equation, right? For the heat equation, you will have H equal to two and uh, let's say uh, h equal to 2, that means you can have sigma smaller than 2. So sigma can be 1. Uh, so that means, for example, you can have L2 right hand side and L2 or even uh, with negative smoothness G. Then you can have H1 in space immediately. Now for the proof, uh, we start with the Duhamel's principle in free space. And the point is that, okay, for the first part here, you can see that there is a exponential decay in psi and having, uh, and we need to measure the whole thing in HS. So we need to have polynomial decay in psi. So this exponential decay is enough to imply any polynomial decay. For the second term, we have exponential decay here, uh, but the problem is that when tau is large, t minus tau will be small, so this exponential decay will degenerate. So that's why we cannot have uh, arbitrary right-hand side, but we have some limit on uh, on, let's say, the roughness of the right-hand side. 
So we need to measure the right hand side in HS norm. And remember that this notation means it's be it behaves like xi for large xi and behaves like one for small xi. So basically it allows you to divide by. So you can write this. Uh, so we have we need hs smoothness of f but we have hs minus sigma smoothness so the difference is sigma that means we need to show that this expression is bounded basically we want to look at the maximum of this function if you draw the graph of this function it would look like this and uh, by taking uh, derivatives you can see that here just think of the absolute value of xi as the variable and take the derivative <coughs> and we can derive this condition for the uh, maximizer here and uh, from that condition we can substitute into we can substitute into this expression to find the maximum value and the maximum value turns out to be just t minus tau to the power minus sigma over h. So we write our bound again, the first one here. Now for the second part, those exponentials became like this. And it, you need to integrate over tau. So when can we integrate this quantity is, is precisely when sigma divided by h is strictly smaller than 1 and uh, the result will look like this so that gives our bound